Hola amigos, my name is Tony and this time out I'm going to be reminiscing about Sergio Corbucci's 1970s spaghetti western masterpiece and his best film Compañeros. When it comes to spaghetti, Sergio Leone casts a pretty big shadow. The Dollar Trilogy and Once Upon a Time in the West are towering classics of cinema in which the elements of mood, tempo, sound and vision coalesce with near perfection to form an unforgettable pantheon of western movie mythology. That's fucking flowery, isn't it? No matter. If the glove fits, shove it on your wooden hand. What's he talking about now, you ask? I'm guessing. Stick with it and you'll see. Leone's success opened the floodgates for a lot of cheaply made altars from Italy in the 60s and early 70s. Sergio Corbucci is primarily known as the director and co-writer of two spaghetti western classics, the original Django with Franco Nero in 1966 and The Great Silence in 1968. Most genre fans would probably rate these two over and above Compañeros, and although both earlier films have the distinct and bizarre quality of macabre movie operas of death and destruction, they're nowhere near as much fun or quite as downright off the wall as his later work of genius, which puts Compañeros in a class of its own. I don't know if sophisticated is the right descriptor here, no, frankly it's not, but Compañeros is at any rate a more self-aware creation, falling somewhere in the middle ground between zany parody and morbidly violent morality fable. To illustrate what I mean, I'll give you the gist of the plot, the setting, and the characters, and explain just why it's so damn good. But first, let's start with me. I didn't get to see it until, if memory serves, the summer of 73. It washed up at my local cinema, the Market Hall, as more X-rated fodder for my insatiable consumption. So, on a hot summer night, I found myself sat in the cool, cavernous dark of the theater, theater, yeah, uh, with no preconceptions or unrealistic expectations. The unexpectedly astonishing photoplay that unspooled before my eyes burned forever into my brain pan as something I came to know as essential viewing. My love affair with this film continues to this day. Set in the Mexican Revolution, various rebel factions are vying for power and influence. Che Guevara lookalike El Vasco, played by Cuban actor Thomas Millian, has just put a sword through the chest of an army general in his hometown of San Bernardino, inciting a revolt. Rebel General Mongo, noting that El Vasco might be of some use, he isn't, recruits him into his revolutionary army. Meanwhile, one Yodlaf Peterson, Franco Nero, aka the Swede, aka the Penguin, a mercenary and gunrunner, arrives in town with a train carriage full of guns and explosives to sell to General Mongo. He rigs the carriage to blow up if anyone tampers with it. Local rebel glamour girl Lola Iris Bourbon is the leader of a gang of young student revolutionaries, followers of Professor Zantos, Fernando Rey, who is an advocate of revolution without bloodshed or violence. You know, passive resistance, peace, love and reason, idealistic stuff that hardly ever works and certainly ain't gonna work in this movie. Xantos is being held by the US military in a base just over the border. There is an impregnable safe in San Bernardino Bank to which only Xantos has the combination. General Mongo needs to open the safe to get money to pay Yodlaf Peterson, aka the Swede, aka the Penguin, for the armaments in the rigged train carriage. So he decides to send Peterson and El Vasco across the border to liberate Xantos and bring him back. Slight problem here. Peterson and Vasco hate each other with a vengeance and certainly don't trust each other. But nevertheless, off they go. Add to this the main villain of the piece, John, a dope-smoking Irish fortune hunter played by Jack Palance. John fronts a gang of three weirdo henchmen and is an ex-partner of Peterson's. Peterson left him to die by crucifixion in Cuba when a deal went sour. He was only saved by his pet Hawk Marsha, who pecked off his hand so he could escape. Now he has a black leather glove wooden prosthesis in its place and nurses a burning desire for revenge. What follows is one fast-paced foray into a knockabout maelstrom of gunplay, violence, torture, double-cross and destruction as El Vasco and Peterson engage in their mission to retrieve Professor Santos and get the safe safely cracked. 
And it's absolutely lovely stuff. Backed up by the peerless Eddie Morricone's addictive score, it's a frantic blast. It's fun and dares to throw in so many conflicting elements that it shouldn't really work at all, but somehow it does. Some of the attempts at broad comedy and gallows humour fall flat and mostly fail due to the script and dialogue being unable to effectively support them. It's like a stand-up comedian who mistimes his gags repeatedly, Tommy Cooper minus the insight and deliberate intent. That dogged failure to get it right eventually succeeds in making it compelling watching and does raise a smile or two. The absurd banana skin gag and a running joke in search of a punchline, why Peterson gives Vasco a silver dollar when they first meet, pays off with a resounding clunk that is only funny because it's not. It's a tricky dynamic to explain but those who have seen it will probably get the idea. Most of the performances range from exaggerated mugging and miming to the absolute bizarre. Palance rasping softly in an appalling Irish accent that travels all over the place and ends up sounding like a spoof dialect no one has ever heard before. You want it dead or alive? And since I can choose, I naturally favour the first way. He hams it up to the hilt, constantly puffing on a spliff and muttering affectionately to his pet hawk, or giggling maniacally before killing or torturing someone. <laughs> <laughs> his characterization is one of those see it to believe it items. He's thoroughly tapped into his inner Vincent Price and seemingly let off the leash by Kobuchi just runs riot with it. The Peterson Vasco relationship is a distinct echo of the Eastwood Wallach partnership in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Only Vasco is a few more brain cells down the spinal column from Wallach's Tuco, if you can imagine that. It's as if a young Norman wisdom landed a gig playing a Mexican revolutionary. Nero is always watchable and hits the right notes of cavalier bravado and nonchalant verve and violence throughout. Iris Bourbon's Lola looks thoroughly gorgeous, but her falling in love with Vasco, who is both abusive and witless, doesn't really make much sense, unless her taste in men is intentionally directed towards mindless aggressors who rip off her blouse to expose her naked breasts, and in so doing, her conspicuous bikini line into the bargain. There is a preoccupation with torture pepper in the narrative. Vasco buries Peterson up to his neck in the dirt and arranges for a stampede of horses to crush his skull. John ties a noose around Peterson's neck and leaves him teetering on a barrel at a deserted railway station. Another nod to the good, the bad and the ugly. John straps Vasco to a boulder, straps a wicker basket to his naked abdomen and puts a starving rat in the basket and leaves them to it. At first it tickles and Vasco laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> <laughs> the laughter soon turns to terrified screaming, much like real life, really. <laughs> None of these modes of fiendish and painful murder actually succeed, but they do make for some tense and uncomfortable viewing. In the end, General Mongo is exposed for a villainous money grubber, using the revolution as a means of financial gain, and gets his in a hail of bullets. Peterson and Vasco face off in a climactic showdown, but end up saving each other's lives. Peterson blows John to bits by hurling a religious relic, the only item of real financial value in San Bernardino, at the rigged train carriage upon which John has rather carelessly chosen to stand with his his rifle. Hit the ground! His smouldering wooden hand is all that's left of him. Vasco finds love and a cause, choosing to stay with Lola and the student revolutionaries. Peterson rides out, but as he crests the hill, sees the massed military force of the Federales advancing towards the town. He has an epiphany, turns, and starts to gallop back to join the fight, and Morricone's immense theme tune kicks in. I guess the moral is that there are some things more important than money. Personally, I'm not sure what they are, but I'll buy it for a tenner. Redemption and a happy ending? Well, judging by the scale of the army heading in their direction, they're all fucking doomed, quite honestly. Or maybe not. Love, love, love it. On the downside, the dialogue is as janky as hell. The comedy moments lack Leone's sharp and cynical edge. Much more arch and, well, dumb is as good a word as any. The first 20 to 30 minutes are a bit pedestrian whilst the plotline is set up. But that apart, it's worth sticking with it, because when it gets going, it shifts up several gears, and the fast-paced action set pieces have a wild kinetic energy that maintains engagement. It's not as epic in sweep and vision as The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, or Once Upon a Time in the West, but it does have a scaled-down power and scope, and it cheers me up every time I watch it, which is saying quite something. 
If you like westerns and if you've never seen it, do yourself a favour and seek it out. Get some spaghetti fun up in your soul compañero. I'll wager you won't regret it. Thank you for your time and attention, whoever you are, wherever you may be. If you've been entertained in some small way, please consider hitting like and maybe even subscribing. Meanwhile, here's a song called Choose Your Weapons With Care. Some advice, that. Yeah. 